on your mind, and you have a hard time getting it off your mind. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe something that uh, you just maybe think about all the time, you think about every day uh, there, and uh, we've been doing a little bit of moving right now. We went, I hate to say it, but we had to take a trip to the state up north last week, and I don't even like to say the word uh, there because I want the Lord to work today. And uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, we had to go up and move Christian into his home there, and uh, and it went okay. And, uh, uh, and somebody asked, "Is he living in a good area?" I said, "Well, it's Michigan. I don't think it's a great area." I mean, anyway. <laughs> no, just teasing. Uh, there, but uh, got him all moved, and uh, Brother Jared and Miss Savannah, we got to get them uh, moved as well, and then Brother and Mrs. Woodside moving, and so we got moving on the brain right now, and I said, man, if I can never get all these people moved, but uh, uh, you know, you go through things like that, and it seems like sometimes it's constantly on your mind, and uh, Maybe you're going through something. You say, Pastor, I'm thinking about this every day. Can I say, according to the Word of God, there's something that ought to be on our minds every day. And the Bible talks about it in verse number 42. And I like this first phrase, it is a night to be much observed. It is a night to be much observed. As I was reading through the Word of God, uh, about a month ago or so, and I came across this passage of Scripture. The Lord worked on my heart there. Really, here's the thought. You ought to never forget the day that you got saved. You ought to never forget the day that you were delivered out of Egypt. I love the story of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Think about it. For 430 years, God's people had been slaves in the land of Egypt. Now, Egypt is a picture of what, church? Tell me what. The world. Egypt is a picture of the world. And after 430 years where grandparents have been talking about it and great-grandparents, and, and finally it gets to the day where they're finally leaving Egypt. And you remember that last plague, the Passover, where... The death angel came through and slew all the firstborn of Egypt. And thank God that the blood had to be applied to the doorpost. But if the blood was applied, you were safe. And I want to say, throughout the years, even 4,000 years later, nothing has changed. And your only hope for salvation is if the blood has been applied. And thank God the blood will never lose its power. Amen. You know, there's a lot of churches today and a lot of religions that... Stop talking about the blood, but let it always be on our mind. Let it always be on our thought. And thank God for His precious blood. That's our only Amen. hope. You ever thought about maybe a prayer that you prayed? And you say, well, I don't know if I'd ever get an answer to that prayer. And finally, finally, the day comes where it seems like the sun shines through. And, and guess what? God delivers again. And God answers prayer. You just kind of scratch your head a little bit and you think, boy, oh boy, I, I didn't know if this was going to get answered. And God answers that prayer again. I love thinking about the rapture that's going to take place of the church. We are rapidly approaching. I had someone tell me the other day, he said, I don't think we're anywhere close to the rapture. And I said, I hate to disagree, but I believe it could happen any day, any day. And he said, well, that temple has to be rebuilt. And I said, they will. They will rebuild it there. It, it won't take long. For three and a half years, they'll rebuild it there. And, and, and the Antichrist will sit on the throne halfway through. But thank God, the rapture, it, it's going to take place any day. And I'll tell you, with everybody getting sick, and it seems like everything is going on. I tell folks all the time, I can't wait for Jesus to come again. And I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt it's going to happen. You say, well, what is it about the rapture? Well, it's a fulfilled expectation. Man, I have been expecting it to happen for years and years and years and years. And say, man, 
1993, no, it didn't happen. 2000, no, it didn't happen. In 2012, no, and 2017, and here we are, 2022. You say, well, when is it going to happen? I don't know the day or the hour, but I know we're in the season. Praise God. And I'm excited that when it happens, all the expectation will be fulfilled. Aren't you glad for that? Finally, we've been thinking about someday I'll see him. Someday I'm going to look on his face. Well, can you just think about it? It is going to happen. We are going to look at our Savior. Amen. Amen. In the flesh, we're going to see Jesus. Amen. That same Jesus that went out of here 2,000 years ago, he's coming back for us. And it will be a wonderful, fulfilled expectation. Well, verse number 42, the Bible says this, It is a night to be much observed. What is he talking about there? Well, that, that night that he's talking about is the night that they were delivered out of Egypt. He said, I want you to always remember. Now, that word much observed, that means much celebrated. To be celebrated and not just once a year. And not just once every couple of years, but every day we ought to celebrate and we ought to observe the day that we were delivered out of the world. That we were delivered out of Egypt. There's some things that we ought to have our mind on every day. I'm telling you what, I'm thankful for the Lord every day that I have another day to serve Him. And I say, Lord, thank you for giving me another day to serve you. Amen. That's all that I want to do with my life is serve the Lord. I say, Lord, thank you for the family that you gave me. And Lord, thank you for the church that you gave me. But I want to tell you, number one on the list is, Lord, thank you for the day that you saved my never dying soul. Amen. And I want to tell you, I never want to get over that day. Amen. How many of you remember the day that you got saved? Here's what I'm saying. If you remember it today, you ought to remember it and you ought to celebrate it. You ought to observe it every day. Well, what's the big deal about that? I want to tell you, it's going to keep you from some things. And you remember when you got saved, it's going to keep you from some things. I want to tell you, Satan will try and sneak up to you sometimes. How I many of you know what I'm talking about? He'll try to discourage you. Satan will try to fill your heart with fear. But you know what you need to do every day is you need to take him back to that place and say, Devil, I'm taking you back to the place when I got saved. Sometimes the devil even will sneak up to you and he'll whisper in your ear, You're not even saved. How yeah. I many of you know what I'm talking about? And that's what the devil does. And you know what? If the devil can keep you doubting, your own salvation, oh, he can keep you in a world of trouble. But you know what I say? Hey, Dad, you know where I take him? I take him back to the old Hawkins grocery store in that parking spot. I say, hey, I remember. I was there. I'm a witness of what happened to me. And every day we ought to say, Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering me out of this world. I want to say, first of all, this morning, we need to remember and we need to observe who we used to be. I don't often say that we ought not look fondly back on the past life. You know, if you were a drunk and you were into drugs and all those kind of things, you ought never look fondly back on the old life. You ought never to say, man, I wish I was still drinking and smoking and cussing and swearing and, and all those things. You ought not look fondly on it, but you know what? Every now and then it's good to look back where you used to be and say, thank God I'm not what I used to be. Amen. Amen. Thank God I'm not what I used to be. Sometimes it's good to look back on what you used to be to realize where you are. Israel was enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. But finally, the day came, and I like to think of it like this. Finally, after 430 years, the day came when the chains were broken. And man, the Bible talks about it right there in chapter number 12. How they walked out of Egypt with a high hand, and they would they they had favor with the Egyptians, and they spoiled the Egyptians. I mean, they walked out of there, and I like to think about it. They left the chains behind. Hey, think about it. Think about it with 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 the children of Israel. No more Egypt. Hey, no more slavery. No more pagan customs. Hallelujah. No more worshiping the world's idols. 
Uh, no more brick making. Amen, Brother Jared? Amen. Amen. No more brick making. Hallelujah. No more in chains. No more slaves. No more taskmasters. Nobody beating you. What happened? Hey, when they left Egypt, I want to tell you, here's what happened. They left the chains in Egypt. They left everything behind. And here's what I want to say. The day that you were delivered and the day that you got saved, I promise you this, the chains were broken. The chains were broken. And now it's up to us to leave the chains behind. Amen. Don't you dare pick those chains up and put them on again. You've been delivered out of this world. Hey, when you got saved, I want to tell you, I'm getting ready to preach here. I better take this coat off here just for a second here. Amen. Listen, when you got saved, I want to tell you, the chains were broken. You say, Pastor, I got saved, but I can't give something up. Hey, listen, it's not up to you to give it up. When you got saved, God broke the chains. Now, here's what we want to do. We want to pick up the old life again. Hey, listen, when you got saved, God broke the chains of smoking. I promise you that. He gave, according to the word of God, he gave you power over those cigarettes. Hey, when you got saved, God gave you power over alcohol. When you got saved, God gave you power and God gave you victory over the drugs and over the past life and over the pornography. God gave you victory over that. Leave the chains behind. Don't you dare go back and pick up those chains. Right. I want to tell you, you, go back and pick up the chains of smoking after you got saved. It will be twice as hard to give it up. Because you will be trying to do it on your own. So many people say, Pastor, I got saved, but I can't give this up. And I say this, I promise you, when you got saved, the chains were broken. I've heard too many stories. I've heard people say, hey, when I got saved, man, I saw that wicked alcohol in, in my refrigerator, and I didn't know for sure, nobody told me this, but somebody on the inside said, that's not right anymore. Right. Right. And you know what they did? They took that alcohol and they dumped it down the sink. Amen. Praise God. They took those cigarettes and they threw them away. Uh, they took that old life and they took the pornography and they said, we don't want this anymore. Hey, just for a moment this morning, let's remember and thank God that we're not what we used to be. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about Miss Grace Smith. And this is hard to think about with Miss Grace Smith. She's so sweet. Isn't she, Brother Bob? Yeah. You better say yeah. Brother. <laughs> Amen. Miss Grace, she's so sweet. But she came up to me one day. She said, oh, Pastor, I used to cuss like a sailor. I said, I do not believe that. And then she cussed me out. I said, okay. No, she didn't. She didn't. She didn't. She didn't for the I'm just kidding. But she told me, she said, Pastor, I used to cuss like a sailor. And I said, what happened? She said, I got saved. <laughs> you know what happened? The Lord broke the chains when she got saved. Hey, you don't talk like that anymore. Amen. You don't have to talk like that anymore. And you say, well, I don't know how to change my vocabulary. You don't have to. God will. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you, I, I remember in my life, it's going to sound crazy, but I remember in my life saying really one cuss word in my life. And I want to tell you, when I said it, it was like somebody stuck a knife in me. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I grieved the Holy Spirit of God. And I want to tell you, I wanted to fall to my knees and say, oh, wretched man that I am. The Bible says, can sweet water and bitter water come out of the same well? My brother, these things ought not so to be. Uh, sweet water and bitter can't come out of the same fountain. Hey, the same way you talk at church on Sunday ought to be the same way you talk on Monday at work. Praise God. I was talking to, you know, Brother Woodside. He got saved out of the Catholic church. Thank God. Amen. Brother Bill Grady got saved out of the Catholic Church. Brother Peter Ruckman got saved out of the Catholic Church. William Tyndale, Martin Luther got saved out of the Catholic Church. What happened? Well, when they got saved, the chains were broken of the Catholic Church. Amen. Amen. And that's what the Catholic Church is. It is an enslavement. Hey, why do you think they say if you're not Catholic, you're not going to heaven? Yeah. What is that? That's an enslavement. 
an enslavement to the tradition, enslavement to mass, enslavement to the Eucharist, and, and to all those customs and rituals. What is it? It's putting people in chains. They say, unless you're part of the Catholic Church, you're not going to heaven. You know what? When you get saved, when you meet Jesus, the chains are broken. God help us. If anybody ever went to Grace Baptist Church, ended up going back to a Catholic or a Lutheran church. Hey, you know what happened? When you got saved, the chains of religion were broken, brother. Don't you dare go back and pick up those chains. I was talking to Brother Bill Lamb. Brother Bill, he said, Pastor, I used to drink like a fish. Brother Bill, pray for him. He's in the hospital right now. He wouldn't mind me saying this. Brother Bill used to drink. He said, man, I said, when did it change? He said, well, I walked from the Lutheran church. I walked across the street to the Baptist church, and I got saved and baptized that Sunday morning. I said, praise the Lord. You say you didn't get saved in the Lutheran church? He said, no, they weren't telling me how to get saved. I had to go to the Baptist church for them to tell me how to get saved. I was talking to someone just the other day. I said, man, when did you get saved? I said, where do you go to church? They told me this non-denominational type of church, the river, the flood, the story, something like that. And I said, I said, oh, you, you get saved there? They said, no, two independent fundamental Baptist soul winners knocked on my door. I said, why are you going to a Baptist church then? Wouldn't that make sense? But well, Brother Bill Lamb said, I walked across the street from the Lutheran church, and I got saved, an old conservative Baptist church. I got saved and baptized. He said, my wife, Miss Jenny, he said, Miss Jenny told me, yeah, that, that, you ought not be taking that bread. Don't you dare take that bread. How I many of you remember Miss Jenny Lamb? Praise it. She'd tell you how it is, buddy. I'll tell you. Uh, we used to have her as a babysitter. Little Christian and little Savannah. Remember that, Savannah? I don't know if you remember. She just asked why. She said, Chris. I had to spank them kids. I said, you go ahead, sister. Go right, go right ahead. Uh, and and she'd tell you how it is. And I, I miss her. I'm going to see her again in heaven. Praise the Lord. But Brother Bill Lamb said, hey, what happened? The chains of alcohol were broken. Now, don't you dare, after you get saved, don't you dare pick up those chains again of alcohol. I want to tell you that well, here's where we live. Now, I'm from Kentucky. That's where I was born. And my backyard was a tobacco field. It's just everybody did. In fact, my uncle's a free will Baptist pastor, and he still chews that tobacco. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Man, when I was a kid, I used to think, man, that's big stuff. I'd get that big league chew bubble gum. You know you know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like a self-righteous face on that. I get that big league. I want to be like my uncle, you know? And you know what you do with that big league bubble gum, brother Micah? He still does it. I can see you got it in your lip right now, don't you? Uh, you tell, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Any, yeah, you get that big league bubble gum and you put it right there. Uh, you know, I told you about my grandma, my grandma McCoy. She had three teeth. She used all three of them on this stick tobacco, and she will give me a little kiss. No, it's okay. She had tobacco running right around here. Give me a little kiss. No, thank you, Grandma. I love you, but no. Amen. Brother Jim Silverwood, he said, you know, Pastor, I got saved at General Motors. He said, I was reading my Bible, and Brother Virgil Ward, and, and uh, who else? He said, somebody else was there. And, and I think Brother Silverwood, uh, or no, Brother Silverwood let, uh, was let, and it might have been Brother Bill. I'm not real sure how that went. But Brother Virgil Ward, but Brother Silverwood was reading his New Testament. At General Motors and the Lord saved him. He said, you know, he said, I was, I was smoking packs of cigarettes a day. He said, but man, when I got saved, something happened. And you know what I want to say? I can tell you what happened. The chains were broken. Right. Amen. And don't you dare, don't you dare pick up those chains. You say, well, Pastor, are you saying that you're all good? You never smoked or drank? No, I'm saying I was in the worst case because here's what I was. I was playing religion, but I was living in doubt. Right. I was, I was one of those Christian kids that were sitting right here on the road, and I was just playing church. I was playing religion, but I wasn't saved in my heart. And I want to tell you, the day that I got gloriously saved, the chains of doubt and the chains of fear were broken. And I want to tell you, I'll never pick them up again. Thank God this morning. Somebody say amen. Help me out this morning. I'm going to wait a long time. Amen. Maybe the pancakes are taking effect this morning. <laughs> Brother Joe Boyd, evangelist Joe Boyd. I traveled with Brother Joe Boyd in the summer of 1992. And man, I, I learned a lot about the ministry. Joe Boyd was part of the 1948 Silver Anniversary Team of Sports Illustrated. 
played tackle for Texas A&M and actually won the MVP of the 1940 Rose Bowl, I believe, uh, Brother Joe Boyd. The Lord broke his neck. You say, yeah, the Lord broke, yeah, the Lord broke his neck. He got out of football. He was going to be drafted by the Washington Redskins. And don't you hate all these sports team changing their name? Yeah. Give me a break. Guardians, something like that. I, I, I get sick of that stuff. But he was part of Texas A&M college team. Great, great football player. Big, big, big guy. And, and they said about Joe Boyd, I was reading a little bit about him this week. They said he could outplay, outfight, outdrink, and outswear anybody on the team. But you know what happened? God got a hold of his heart. God saved him. And he didn't spend the next 50 years playing football. He spent the next 50 years in full-time evangelism traveling all over the United States telling people that Jesus loves you. Seeing people saved and baptized all over. You say, what a wasted life. No, I, I, I beg to differ. What a great life. Amen. Amen. Throw away the football. Who cares about the touchdown? He got to see somebody saved. Yep. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. This morning, I'm saying let's celebrate what God has brought us out of. Miss Shannon Fuentes, she was going to give a testimony. She had to leave early this morning. But she was going to give a testimony this morning. Miss Shannon was into drugs, lived a, a hard life, even went to prison. And she said, Pastor, the Lord got a hold of my heart in prison. She said, you know, I got to the point where I didn't want to lose my kids. She said, the Lord got a hold of my heart. And man, she has an awesome, she was going to give her testimony this morning. But she said, Pastor, I want to tell them about how good God is. About how good my God is and what God has brought me out of. I'm saying this morning, it might be a good thing for you this morning to remember who you used to be. Yeah. And I'm not talking about it in a good way. I'm talking about like Paul said, and such were some of you. But now ye are justified and ye are sanctified. Praise the Lord. Amen. Remember who you used to be and say, thank God. I might not be what, I'm, what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Amen. Amen. How many of you raise your hand this morning and say, Pastor, when I look back, I thank God I'm not what I used to be. Woo! Thank God. That will be some shouting this morning. Thank God. I'm not, hey, that would be good for you every day. Every day. The Bible says to be much observed, much observed, celebrated. Thank God I'm not what I used to be. But I want to say, secondly, remember what you are today. Remember what you are today. Finally, in Exodus chapter number 12, the day has finally come. After 430 years, they're free. I mean, they walk out of there, and they are absolutely free. I mean, the chains are broken. And, and listen, that some of them, they never seen anything like that. All of them, all of them. They never seen anything like that. And I like the fact that, man, Joseph even said it 400 years earlier. Hey, I'm not staying here. Take my bones out of here when you leave. And sure enough, 400 years later, here they walk out of Egypt and Moses would walk out. But the Bible says he wasn't leaving without Joseph's bones. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful day it was when we got saved. I want to tell you, when you talk about the day you got saved, it does something. I want to tell you, it will encourage you. You just try it. Did you know sometimes your ear needs to hear your mouth thank God for your salvation? And it never fails when we get in a good fellowship meeting and we start talking about the day we got saved and somebody starts talking about it and the tears start flowing and God starts working. Why? Because God said every day I want you to celebrate the day that I brought you out of the world, the day that you got saved. And you say, Pastor, I'm so discouraged and I'm so down. You know what that is? That's the devil. The devil wants to discourage you, get you to think that there's nothing more in this life, get you to think that things will never change, that you'll always be the same. But I want to tell you this morning, without a shadow of a doubt, you start talking about the day that God brought you from death unto life. And I want to tell you, it will encourage you. You need to be encouraged from the Word of God. Man, I start thinking about it. And I show my kids. We drive by there every day. I say, boys, that's, a, that's where I got saved right there. Hey, that's special to me. Because a miracle happened that day. I mean, I was in the worst case. Because I was a Christian boy. I was sitting right down here. And I thought everything was okay. But man, the thought hit my heart. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. And thank God that God came.
came looking for me that day. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. But boy, I want to tell you, he moved into the car in my 1992 Oldsmobile Delta 88, and he moved right into the car, and he said, Chris, you need to get saved. And boy, I've told you before, I argued with the Lord for about a mile, and I, I pulled into Hulk at the grocery store, and I put it in park, and just like it was yesterday, I remember putting that, I said, Lord Jesus, I know you're working on my heart. Nobody else was in the car, just me and the Lord that day. And boy, he was working on my heart. He said, Chris, you need to get saved. And I said, Lord, I know I need to get saved before it's too late. I repent of my sin. I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. And I want to tell you, you're talking about a thousand pounds rolling off my back. Thank God I've never doubted since then. I've never had one fear about whether I die or not. I told Lisa, I said, don't worry about my funeral. Just kick me to the curb. Save the funeral money. Just kick me to the curb. Or you, you can do this ultimate embalming now. How many of you heard about that? I said, you can embalm me and just send me in the easy chair and just put my hand like this. She said, that would be creepy. And I said, thanks a lot. But you know what? Telling people about the Lord, it'll encourage you. Not only that, it will convict others. You know, if somebody's not saved, you start talking about the day you got saved. And I want to tell you, you're talking about Holy Spirit conviction. That's right. We went around the room about a year and a half ago in the hotel room. And we were just having a little church service. Savannah so was there. Jerry, were you there? You were there. We don't invite him for a lot of stuff. But sometimes. But we invited him. And he was there. We started talking about the day we got saved. We got all the way around to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, Dad, I don't know that I'm saved. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. There's nothing like when your kids get saved. You know what I'm talking about? When the tear, little tears start flowing. I remember Savannah, 10 years old. Dad, I don't know what I'm saying. And boy, she said the sweetest sinner's prayer. Lord, save me. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. We were sitting here in Crestline, and we pulled into our, our driveway in Crestline, and my wife said, honey, I don't know that I'm saved. I said, well, you need to get a surety of that salvation. You need to get saved. She's like, I'm going to do it Sunday. I said, no. She's like, well, let's go in. I'll do it. I said, no, right here, right now, right now. And I'll never forget, in that car, my wife bowed her head and accepted Jesus as her Savior. I'll never forget it. Those are special times. And I'm saying, hey, listen, when you get in the, in the dumps and you get in the darkest of times, just remember when you got saved. It's a night to be much observed. Hey, I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget that day. Not only will it convict others, but I want to tell you, it will strengthen the family of God. There's something about salvation that strengthens the church. I mean, it strengthens the family of God. I can tell you, I can give you testimony after testimony of people that sat right here. And as we preach, and I'm going to tell you, they come down the aisle and tears flowing. I don't know that I'm saved. I'll never forget Joseph Sackman. And man, had earrings all over him and tattoos everywhere and earrings all over. And, and man, walked that aisle and the tears were flowing. He said, I don't know that I'm saved. And man, he got gloriously saved right here. I remember Debbie Edsweiler, and she came forward and accepted the Lord. And now she's in heaven. Just died a couple weeks ago, and she's in heaven now. But praise the Lord, never forget that day that you got saved. Why does God want us to remember this day? I want to tell you, there's a time when that's all you got to hang on to. There's a time when you don't really have a whole lot else to hang on to, but you know that you're saved. Ever come a time in your life when things are so unsure about everything? Your health is unsure. Your finances are unsure. What are we going to do tomorrow? Your relationships are unsure. I mean, there's nothing you can count on except one thing. You know you're saved. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know that you're saved. I was Thursday night I was sitting with Brother Jonah and Bonnie Keaton. And Miss Bonnie was telling me about her mom. She was not, I think 98 years old when she passed. I think her name was Mildred. It was Mildred. And she went to church here. And, uh, and she passed in 1991. Miss Jenny, you might remember her maybe there. And uh, I can't remember her last name, what they said. But in 1991, she passed away. She was 98 years old. And so she would have been born back in the 1800s. 
there. But on her deathbed, she said, man, she wasn't, she said she wasn't in her right mind, Pastor, all the way. But one thing she kept saying to her kids, she'd hold out her hand and she said, Bonnie, can you tell me, have I done enough for Jesus? She said, have I done enough for Jesus? Did I tell everybody that I could about Jesus? And she looked at her kids and she said, are you guys going to keep serving Jesus? Have I done enough for Jesus? She just said, saying that over and over. And Bonnie said, Mom, you've done enough for Jesus. You've done enough for Jesus. I said, man, what a wonderful thing to be saying. You know, the song says, I wonder have I done my best for Jesus. Probably the truth of it is there's nobody in here that we've done our best. And I want to do my best for Jesus. I want to tell other people about him. I remember when I got saved, talking about encouraging others and strengthening the family of God. I said, Lord, can we just keep this between me and you? I said, I know you saved me, but can we keep it between me and you? Because everybody already thinks that I'm saved. And at first, I didn't really get it. I knew the answer. But I fought it for about a month. And I was sitting way right back about where Brother Henry is back there. And I'll never forget the Lord spoke to my heart during an invitation. And the pastor was standing right down here. And I stepped out. And I came forward. And I said, Pastor, I want to tell you, I got saved. And here I am. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I mean, I was teaching the kids. But I wasn't saved. I'll never forget, man, it, it was a humbling thing. But the Lord said, I mean, it was almost like the Lord booted me out. I'm not talking about irresistible grace or anything like that. But it was almost like the Lord booted me out into the aisle. And I said, I got to. I got to go and tell somebody I got saved. I remember standing there with the pastor. And he started crying. He said, Chris, I've been praying for you for six months. And the Lord will do something in your heart. I made that, that, that profession of my salvation. And the next week, here comes somebody over around where Brother Brad is. He came down the aisle, Brother Jimmy Arnold. I'll never forget, Brother Jimmy Arnold came down the next week. He said, man, I need to make sure. I don't know that I'm saved. And Jimmy Arnold was one of my Sunday school teachers. But here's what I'm saying. When you talk about the day you got saved, it strengthens the church. It strengthens the church. You know, I was thinking about with the royal family. When we think about the royal family, we always think about the, the family there in England, there in the uh, Princess, uh, what is, what's her name? What is it? Diana? Not Diana, but the, the, the queen, the queen. Oh, Elizabeth. Is it, a, what is it? Let's take a poll. How many of you think it's Victoria? How many think it's Elizabeth? I don't know, I'm not sure. What is it, Miss Jenny? It's Elizabeth, yes. Queen Elizabeth. Well, you know, you got this royal family. And I don't, I, I, you have to forgive me, I don't understand all of that stuff. I've never really researched it and stuff like that. But I know you got Prince Charles and then uh, Prince Hen Harry, William, Prince William and Harry. Well, I guess Prince Harry, he's done some stuff lately. And uh, something about how, who he married. How many of you know what I'm talking about? He married that Megan. Markle or something like that. And, and I mean almost like disassociated with his own family. And basically his own family had to say you know you're not living very royal. You're not living like you're part of the I mean that's really what they're saying. You're not really living. He said you know fine whatever you know I'll forego everything that I got I, you know. But I thought, started thinking about this. You know when you get saved you are part of a royal family. You're part of the family of God. Now that's pretty royal. Did you know you have royal blood running through your veins? When you get, I mean, that's pretty special. And here's what I want to say. Live like it. Live like it. Live like you're royalty. Live like you're part of the royal family. So many Christians, they say, well, I'll just give that up. I want to do my own thing. I want to have my own life. Hey, I want to tell you, not me. I want to live for Jesus, amen? I want to be numbered with, the, with, with Jesus, and I want to be numbered with the righteous. And when anybody says anything to me, I say, yep, I'm a Christian. Hey, y'all, not ever be ashamed to tell people that you're saved and that you're a Christian. And I said, the most miserable person in this life, now listen to me, the most miserable person in this life is a Christian living like an unsaved person. Amen. Most miserable it's not the unsaved person. They're the enemies of Christ. 
It's not the Christian that's on fire, but the most miserable person is the Christian living like an unsaved person. So I said, first of all, remember what you used to be. Number two, remember what you are today. And then lastly, remember where you're headed. Look at Exodus chapter 13. You're right there. But look at chapter 13 and verse number three. The Bible says, Moses said unto the people, remember this day. In which he came out from Egypt out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out into the, uh, in the month of Abib. And then notice the first phrase, verse number five. It shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land. You know, I want to say this morning, God didn't take them out of Egypt to just be out of Egypt. God didn't take them out of Egypt, and I promise you this, He didn't take them out of Egypt to wander in the wilderness. No, they had a land waiting on them. They had Canaan land waiting on them. What took what should have been only a couple day journey ended up taking them 40 years to get there. But I want to say this morning, remember where you're headed. Remember where your citizenship ought to be, and it is. The Bible says, and, and Paul said, we are seated in heavenly places in heaven. I want to tell you, if you're saved this morning, your citizenship is already in heaven. You know what that means? This world is not your home. Amen. We are just passing through. The Bible calls it sojourners. You know what that means? It's like a pilgrim. You're on a journey. That, you know what that means? You don't put your roots down too deep. The Bible says that Abraham, he lived in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. Why? Because the Bible says that he was looking for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Even Abraham, the Bible said, was looking for a city. Paul said this to Timothy, no soldier entangled himself with the things, with the affairs of this life. You know what that always meant to me? It always means don't put your roots down too deep in this life. Remember where you're headed. Don't get caught up in the things of this life too much. Boy, I want to tell you, it's easy to get caught up in things and forget what's really important. You know, i got to be careful about that because sometimes I'm in such a hurry to do things and, man, I'll be at Lowe's or, 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 or Menards or something like that and I'll be talking to somebody and I'm in a hurry. And I have to remember maybe the person standing in front of me is the reason that I'm here. To give them the gospel. To tell them that Jesus loves them. I'm saying don't get so caught up in the jobs and the things of this life. Making money. Having things and houses and cars. Don't get caught up in that too much. Why? Because when we get called out of here, you're going to leave it behind. Right. You ever think when the rapture takes place, you'll probably have your pick of cars. Yeah. Right. There'll be millions that won't need their cars anymore. Yeah. Jehovah's Witness will be driving around any car they want yeah. here on earth. <laughs> and they'll love it for a little while. Yeah. Uh, they can have my key in. I'll leave the keys in for them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I was thinking about that story of that little boy. They had a priceless vase. And they uh, parents came in. They found a little boy with his hand caught in the vase. And they said, can you get your hand out? And they said, no, I, I can't get my hand out. And well, sure enough, they had to break that priceless vase. And what they found out is the little boy had his hand clenched holding a penny. If he would have just let go, he would have slid his hand right out. But he had his hand clenched with a penny in his hand. And they had to break And You know what I think about sometimes? I think about Christians that have their hands clenched on the things of this life. And I wonder sometimes... If the rapture takes place, how easy will you be able to let it go? Listen, there ought not be anything on this life we're not ready to let it go. Right. Amen. Man, we work so hard for the houses, the cars, the lands, we're going to let it go. I uh, said this at last because I know you'd be thinking about it, but how many of you know Kentucky Fried Chicken? Well, you know the, the beginner of Kentucky Fried Chicken was Colonel Sanders. You know that. Anybody ever hear the story of Colonel Sanders? 
I want you to look it up sometimes. At, at 77 years old, Colonel Sanders got saved. He got saved. 77 years old. He gave a testimony at late 70s. I think it was 1978. And he was right at, I think he was 79 years old when he gave this testimony. But he said this. He said, I wasted a lot of time for 77 years. He said, I wasted a lot of time. He started that Kentucky Fried Chicken there, and he sold his business. He said, I was going to call it uh, Southern Fried Chicken. He said, but I just thought, you know, Kentucky people, they know how to cook chicken, so Kentucky Fried Chicken. Man, started, and that thing just took off. He said he sold the business. He said he sold the business, $500,000, sold it. And he said, man, what would you do with all that money? He said, well, the first 50000 I tithed on. Praise the Lord. He said, after that, he said, man, I gave this to this and this to this and I gave this. He said, man, you've given a lot of money away and he made this statement and I'll never forget it. He said, he, he said this, he said, I can be the richest man in a cemetery. Yeah. He said, but why would I want to be rich in a cemetery? Amen. Amen. Right. Listen to it sometime. The guy's interviewing him. He said, there, he said, there's no reason for me to be the richest person in a cemetery. You know what he was saying? You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. And I want to say this morning, we need to think about what God brought us out of. We need to think about what we got to say to Melissa. Think about where we're headed. And let it be on your minds every day. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. It's a day to be much observed. Every